Europeans flexed their muscles in the second half of the 11th century. They built cities, reorganized the church, created new varieties of religious life, expanded their intellectual horizons, pushed aggressively at their frontiers, and even waged war over 1,400 miles away in what they called the Holy Land. Expanding population and a vigorous new commercial economy lay behind all this. So, too, did the weakness, disunity, and beckoning wealth of their neighbors, the Byzantines and Muslims. In the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks, a new group from outside the Islamic world, entered and took over its eastern half. Eventually penetrating deep into Anatolia, they took a great bite out of Byzantium. Soon, however, the Seljuks themselves split apart, and the Islamic world fragmented anew under the rule of dozens of emirs. Pastoralists on horseback, a Turkic people called the Seljuks, crossed from the region east of the Caspian Sea into Iran in about the year 1000. Within a little over 50 years, the Seljuks had allied themselves with the caliphs as upholders of Sunni orthodoxy, defeated the Bayids, taken over the cities of Iran and Iraq, and started collecting taxes. Between 1055 and 1092, a succession of formidable Seljuk leaders proclaimed themselves rulers, sultans, of a new state. Bands of herdsmen followed in their wake, moving their sheep into the very farmland of Iran, then continuing westward into Armenia, which had been recently annexed by Byzantium. Meanwhile, under Alp Arslan, the Seljuk army harried Syria. This was Muslim territory, but it was equally the back door to Byzantium. Thus the Byzantines got involved, and throughout the 1050s and 1060s they fought numerous indecisive battles with the Seljuks. Then in 1071 a huge Byzantine force met an equally large Seljuk army at Manzikert. The battle ended with the Byzantines defeated and Anatolia opened to a flood of militant nomads. The Seljuks of Anatolia set up their own sultanate and were effectively independent of the great Seljuks who ruled in Iran and Iraq. For the Anatolian Seljuks, this once central Byzantine province was Rum, Rome. Meanwhile, other Turks in the Seljuk entourage took off on their own, hiring themselves out as military leaders. Atsai's IBN Uwak is a good example. For a while, he worked for Alp Arslan, but around 1070, he was called on by the Fatimid governor of Syria to help fight off rebellious Arab tribes there. Dissatisfied with his pay and plunder, Atsais decided to work for himself, briefly carving out his own regional principality centered on Damascus. He was, however, ousted by a son of Alp Arslan, Tutush the I, in 1078. Atsais was born a generation too soon. Later, Men like him were more successful. After the death of Malik Shah I in 1092, the Seljuks could no longer maintain centralized rule over the Islamic world, even though they still were valued, if only to confer titles like Amir on local rulers who crave legitimacy. Nor could the Fatimids prevent their own territories from splintering into tiny emirates, each centered on one or a few cities. Some Amirs were from the Seljuk family. Others were military men who originally served under them. We shall see that the tiny states set up by the crusaders who conquered the Levant in 1099 were, in size, not so very different from their neighboring Islamic emirates. In the western part of North Africa, the Maghrib, Berber tribesmen forged a state similar to that of the Seljuks. Fired with religious fervor on behalf of Sunni orthodoxy, the Berber Almoravids took over northwest Africa in the 1070s and 1080s. In 1086, Invited by the ruler of Seville to help fight Christian armies from the north, they sent troops into Al-Andalus. This military aid soon turned into conquest. By 1094, all of Al-Andalus, not yet conquered by the Christians, was under Almoravid control. Almoravid hegemony over the western Islamic world ended only in 1147, with the triumph of the Almohads, a rival Berber group. Together, the Seljuks and Almoravids rolled back the Shirite wave. They kept it back through a new system of higher education, the madrasas. As we have seen, the Islamic world had always supported elementary schools. The madrasas, normally attached to mosques, went beyond this by serving as centers of advanced scholarship. Their young men attended lessons in religion, law, and literature. Sometimes visiting scholars arrived to debate at lively public displays of intellectual brilliance. More regularly, Teachers and students carried on a quiet regimen of classes on the Quran and other texts. 
In the face of Sunni retrenchment, some Shiite scholars modified their teachings to be more palatable to the mainstream. The conflicts between the two sects receded as Muslims drew together to counter the Crusaders. There would have been no Crusaders if Byzantium had remained strong. But the once triumphant empire of Basil II was unable to sustain its successes in the face of Turks and Normans. We have already discussed the triumph of the Turks in Anatolia. Meanwhile, in the Balkans, the Turkic Pechenegh raided with ease. The Normans, some of whom had established themselves in southern Italy, began attacks on Byzantine territory there and conquered its last stronghold, Bari, in 1071. Ten years later, Norman knights were attacking Byzantine territory in the Balkans. In 1130, the Norman Roger II became king of a territory that ran from southern Italy to Palermo. It was a persistent thorn in Byzantium's side. Clearly, the Byzantine army was no longer very effective. Few themes were still manned with citizen soldiers, and the emperor's army was also largely made up of mercenaries. But the Byzantines were not entirely dependent on armed force. In many instances, they turned to diplomacy to confront the new invaders. When Emperor Constantine IX was unable to prevent the Pechenegh from entering the Balkans, he shifted policy, welcoming them, administering baptism, conferring titles, and settling them in depopulated regions. Much the same process took place in Anatolia, where the emperors at times welcomed the Turks to help them fight rival Dinatoi. Here the invaders were sometimes also welcomed by Christians who did not adhere to Byzantine orthodoxy. The Monophysites of Armenia were glad to have new Turkic overlords. The Byzantine grip on its territories loosened and its frontiers became nebulous, but Byzantium still stood. There were changes at the imperial court as well. The model of the public emperor ruling alone with the aid of a civil service gave way to a less costly, more familial model of government. To be sure, for a time competing Dinatoi families swapped the imperial throne. But Alexius I Calmness, a Dallasinus on his mother's side, managed to bring most of the major families together through a series of marriage alliances. Until her death in 1102, Anna Dallasina, Alexius's mother, held the reins of government while Alexius occupied himself with military matters. At his revamped court, which he moved to the Blachernai Palace area, at the northwestern tip of the city, his relatives held the highest positions. Many of them received pronoi, temporary grants of imperial lands that they administered and profited from. Altogether, Byzantine rulers were becoming more like European ones, holding a relatively small amount of territory, handing some of it out in grants that worked a bit like fiefs, spending most of their time in battle to secure a stronghold here, a city there. Meanwhile, Western rulers were becoming less regional in focus, encroaching on Byzantine territory and attacking the Islamic world as well. Behind the new European expansion was a new economy. Draining marshes, felling trees, building dikes. This was the backbreaking work that brought new land into cultivation. With their heavy, horse-drawn plows, peasants were able to reap greater harvests. Using the three-field system, they raised more varieties of crops. Great landowners, the same oppressors against whom the peace of God fulminated, could also be efficient economic organizers. They set up mills to grind grain, forced their tenants to use them, and then charged a fee for the service. It was in their interest that the peasants produce as much grain as possible. Some landlords gave peasants special privileges to settle on especially inhospitable land. The Bishop of Hamburg was generous to those who came from Holland to work soil that was uncultivated, marshy, and useless. As the countryside became more productive, people became healthier, their fertility increased, and there were more mouths to feed. Even so, surprising surpluses made possible the growth of old and the development of new urban centers. Within a generation or two, City dwellers, intensely conscious of their common goals, elaborated new instruments of commerce, self-regulating organizations, and forms of self-government. Around castles and monasteries in the countryside, or at the walls of crumbling ancient towns, merchants came with their wares and artisans set up shop. At Bruges, it was the local lord's castle that served as a magnet. As one late medieval chronicler put it, to satisfy the needs of the people in the castle at Bruges, First merchants with luxury articles began to surge around the gate. Then the wine sellers came. Finally, the innkeepers arrived to feed and lodge the people who had business with the prince. So many houses were built that soon a great city was created. 
Churches and monasteries were the other centers of town growth. Recall Tours as it had been in the early 7th century, with its semi-permanent settlements around the Church of St. Martin, out in the cemetery, and its lonely cathedral nestling against one of the ancient walls. By the 12th century, St. Martin was a monastery, the hub of a small town dense enough to boast 11 parish churches, merchant and artisan shops, private houses, and two markets. To the east, the Episcopal complex was no longer alone. A market had sprung up outside the old western wall, and private houses lined the street leading to the bridge. Smaller than the town around St. Martin, the one at the foot of the old city had only two parish churches, but it was big and rich enough to warrant the construction of a new set of walls to protect it. Early cities developed without prior planning, but some later ones were chartered, that is, declared, surveyed, and plotted out. A marketplace and merchant settlement were already in place at Freiburg and Breisgau when the Duke of Zaringen chartered it, promising each new settler there a house lot of 5,000 square feet for a very small yearly rent. The Duke had fair hopes that commerce would flourish right at his back door and yield him rich revenues. The look and feel of medieval cities varied immensely from place to place. Nearly all included a marketplace, a castle, and several churches. Most were ringed by walls. Within the walls lay a network of streets made of packed clay or gravel. Most cities were situated near waterways and had bridges. The one at Tours was built in the 1030s. Many had to adapt to increasingly crowded conditions. At the end of the 11th century in Winchester, England, city plots were still large enough to accommodate houses parallel to the street. But soon those houses had to be torn down to make way for narrow ones, built at right angles to the roadway. The houses at Winchester were made of wattle and daub. If they were like the stone houses built in the late 12th century, they had two stories, a shop or warehouse on the lower floor and living quarters above. Behind this main building were the kitchen, enclosures for livestock, and a garden. Even city dwellers clung to rural pursuits, raising much of their food themselves. Although commercial centers developed throughout Western Europe, they grew fastest and most densely in regions along key waterways the Mediterranean coasts of Italy, France, and Spain, northern Italy along the Periver, the river system of rhone sonmuse the Rhineland, the English Channel, the shores of the Baltic Sea. During the 11th and 12th centuries, these waterways became part of a single, interdependent economy. At the same time, new roads through the countryside linked urban centers to rural districts and stimulated the growth of fairs, 